Good evening and welcome once again to We Got Planning News for You. Uh, my name's Charlie Banner, uh, Keating Chambers, and um, please can I start by making my usual reminder to viewers to consider making a charity donation in lieu of a registration fee. All the charities we support are on our, on our website, uh, www.wegotplanningnewsforyou.com, um, and uh, of course, please feel free to choose a local charity of your choice instead. Now, we are delighted uh, this evening to be welcoming as our guest this week, uh, Mike Keeley, Chair of the Planning Officer Society, which has 2,000 members in no fewer than 80% of UK local authorities. Uh, Sasha is going to be leading uh, our interview with Mike um, in the second half of the show. Mike, as always, I do say, if there's anything we talk about in the first half that you'd like to discuss or contribute to, please do chip in. But otherwise, uh, don't feel free to do so. And I'll ask you the usual questions. Where are you, where are you calling um, from? What of anything are you drinking? And... Uh, what have you chosen as the theme this evening? Hi, well, I'm uh, calling from my home in Kent. I'm uh, drinking some coffee. Very nice. <laughs> Not just any coffee. Ah, 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 ah. And my theme tonight was uh, one of my favourite songs by by my all-time favourite artist, uh, Changes by David Bowie. I thought it would be appropriate given the uh, times we're in at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, it always reminds me of that joke, doesn't it? Can you perform under pressure? The interview question, no, but I can do a great interview in Rhapsody. Uh, but, but I'm here all week. Uh, <laughs> great stuff, I'll say. I didn't know it was a comedy show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not at <did> I. What did we mind after four years? <laughs> Mary, as always, London Olympics, I think. Is it that, that London Olympics logo behind you? Yes. Uh, Yes, or London, London, but yes. Okay. Anyway, yes. good evening, everyone. Mary Cook from Town Legal, um, and uh, I'm just dreaming of David Bowie and that great song, Mike. As I as I look slightly vacantly in the air, but anyway, it's very nice to see you on the show, and lovely to see my fellow panelists. And I'm drinking water. It's lovely to see you, Mary. Chris, how you doing? It's not bedtime yet, mate. Uh, yes, uh, I'm still in my inquiry. I'm still cross examining as well. <laughs> it's been going on for weeks. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm in an inquiry with uh, Charlie Collins uh, from Savills and we're coming to the end of the inquiry uh, tomorrow and um, I am in a hotel here by the River Thames but I've stayed in the Bromley Court Hotel in Bromley where David Bowie first performed um, uh, in the ballroom I think um, as a picture of him on the wall so um, yeah, a great artist know, know the hotel very well Okay, there you go. Great uh, uh, stuff. They almost don't have very good lights. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, Sasha, lovely to see you, as always. You do have lots of lights. <laughs> I've got lots of lights, absolutely right. And it's, um, I'm in London, and it's lovely to see Mike, and I'm going to probably, I'm going to do the biggest name drop in Have We Got Planning mm-hmm. Is For You's history by telling Mike, I had a weekend with the said David Bowie in 1986 in Gestad, and I will be—I'm always pleased to tell people that he was one of the nicest, if not the nicest, man I ever met in my childhood. Absolutely delightful. And as Chris reminded me, I have a photo of him with my father. From the- oh, that's one photo. Yeah. Wow. They were charming. So, mm. No, a lovely, lovely man. Fantastic. If what went wrong, now I'm a planning I'm sure, I'm sure I'm sure he'd have said the same about you, though he's still here. <laughs> we, we, um, talking about lovely men, we seem to be without Paul. He's uh, otherwise engaged, but um, I'm sure that he'll be joining us um, once he's free from whatever, whatever's holding him up. Still, still cross-examining is what he's just still told me. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, Mary's going to tell us the news. So over to you, Mary. I am, and it's a very packed week, I have to say. So... Um... Uh, for those of you who want to contribute, there's lots of things to contribute to. So the Brownfield Passport, making the most of urban land, um, that is uh, out for consultation. And I encourage everyone to take an active part in that. We've also got um, MHCLG's commissioned research into retrofit first, not retrofit only. And I know quite a few who are contributing to that. Path. Plan, uh, uh, after um, assistance on older persons' homes. So get in touch with them if you want to help uh, with that. PINs have been very busy. They have issued um, a second set 
of updated advice pages, uh, which are all related to planning act uh, applications. They are also uh, bragging about launching a webinar series. I feel like they're trying to get in on our act. Um, but that's quite interesting. And the, the, one of them, uh, the first one, I think, is about evidence gathering for local plans. So what we should watch this space. The other thing that PINs have been up to is issuing some guidance on the use of AI. And they're looking for um, declarations to be made uh, in evidence in the use of AI, which I, I fancy is going to be slightly more difficult than they perhaps in, envisage because they've come up with a very broad definition. Um, the other thing I really wanted to mention is uh, a few things in, uh, in London. So, uh, Claire, uh, Rayner has scrapped Mr. Gove's partial review of the London plan, uh, but in the say, at the same time warned uh, the mayor that he needs to, quote, markedly increase housing delivery in London. Um, in other news, Allies and Morrison's scheme has been, Wimbledon's scheme has been approved okay. by um, the GLA. And then I want to whiz you to Oxford because some of you will have noticed that the Oxford plan has been found unsound on the basis of a failure uh, on the duty to cooperate. And the headline piece in relation to Oxford um, can seem a little confusing because it suggests that they failed because they were advocating more housing than the standard method. And whilst it's true that they were advocating considerably more housing than the standard method uh, would have um, deployed because they were using a pan-Oxfordshire employment projection, um, the reason they failed was because they didn't give the other authorities in Oxfordshire the opportunity to engage on the methodology that they deployed. And the consequence of the methodology was that they were promoting um, something in the order of twice the number of houses that the standard method in Oxford City would have provided. The standard method was 762 per annum. They were suggesting figures in the order of 1322 or 1416. And they were also saying that they could only deliver 481. These are all an annual figures. So they were basically identifying a significant amount of unmet need that they would then be looking to their neighbours to provide without giving the inspectors decided the neighbours adequate opportunity to comment on the methodology deployed. So in a nutshell, um, that is why the examining inspectors have written to Oxford indicating that their plan must fail. Thank you very much, Charlie. Back to you. Thanks, Mary. All encompassing, lots of news. We might come back to the issue, or we're going to come back to the issue of AI with my question to Mike later on. In the meantime, um, I'm going to do the next appeal. Um, Darwin Green um, in uh, South Cambridgeshire. There's a reason why I'm drinking some London's finest tap water, because this case was all about water, or mainly about water. Um, it's a decision issued on the 25th of September on behalf of the Secretary of State by uh, Rishnara Ali MP, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Building Safety and Homelessness. And the decision allowed an appeal by Barrett David Wilson and the Consortium and other developers against the failure of South uh, Cambridgeshire District Council to determine their outline application for residential mixed use development, including a thousand dwellings and various other uses. There was a public inquiry in January, and the inspector who held that inquiry, Rashid Barrett, recommended that permission should be allowed, and the Secretary of State agreed. Um, now, as I said, the main issue in the case and the main issue of wider interest relates to the effects of the uh, development on, on water supply, possible water. And this was the subject of a Rule 6 intervention by the Environment Agency, who was represented by council and called several witnesses. Um, the inspector concluded that while she didn't find the agency's evidence completely compelling, the balance of the evidence for the inquiry suggested that abstraction pressure pressure that's abstracting water to meet the the water supply demands of the uh, development for drinking water etc um, and showers and so on uh, that that was contributing that abstraction to ecological deterioration uh, both on certain water body habitats uh, and also um, on certain surface water bodies that were dependent on those habitats and um, the secretary of state and inspector agreed, however, that though there was that uh, 
concern about abstraction pressure contributing to ecological deterioration. This did not require the dismissal of the appeal or indeed any form of grampian condition uh, restricting the development's uh, commencement or occupation until uh, the issue was solved. Now, why was that? Well, the reason was that uh, they reached the uh, factual judgment that Cambridge Water, who were the relevant water undertaking, would, by the time the development would commence on site, would have a new water resources management plan in place, which would have to be approved by DEFRA with input from the Environment Agency. And the effect of that water resources management plan would would have to be, under the relevant framework, statutory framework for, for water management, that Cambridge Water would be able, through that plan, to deliver a supply of water sufficient to meet the needs of the development and indeed the wider area without a requirement to increase abstraction. In other words, they had to make it, they had to find a way to make it work and they would find a way to make it work even though they hadn't as of the date of the decision. Um, in essence, um, therefore, the finding a solution was a requirement for the Water Resources Management Plan which Cambridge Water were obliged to produce in the projected timescale. So prior to the development that was uh, commenced, I've occupied its occupation really that uh, generates the water demand. So in essence, therefore, the planning system didn't need to be concerned with the effect of the development from abstraction because the water issues were required to be and would be resolved by Cambridge Water through that parallel process, the Water Resources Management Plan under the Water Industry Act and other legislation. And the, the inspector and Secretary of State agreed and noted, sorry, but noted and appeared to agree, I should say, that's a bit ambiguous, but appeared to agree with legal submissions made by the appellants to the effect that a planning decision maker should assume that regulatory regimes under other legislation should operate effectively. There's something in the framework about that. There's also a, a, a legal case from Ireland in the European Court that under relevant EU legislation, that assumption it was said to appears to hold good, and the water resources management plan process upon such regime. It's a striking decision, and many will consider it a welcome breath of fresh air in not allowing the planning system to get caught up with issues that are meant to be addressed under other legislative regulatory regimes. Um, some of you, I don't think I'm the only one obsessed with neutrality, uh, but uh, some of you might be wondering whether some or all of this reasoning might be read across the nutrients issue. Um, and applied by analogy. Well, that's certainly a very interesting question. Um, there's not time to go into that today, uh, but I'm happy to give you my cloud email address. And uh, with, it, with it that, um, I, I'm going to see... Have, have we got Paul back? There we haven't got Paul, so we're going to jump straight on to Chris, and you're going to take us to, to Null Eaton. Yeah, uh, shameless uh, self-publicity there, Charlie. Uh, Mary, well done with you all round. You covered a lot of ground there, if I may say so, and particularly that plea by Shelley Rouse, who's been on the programme for information uh, to PAS about uh, elderly persons' accommodation, a much misunderstood sector. So uh, well done for that shout out and everything else you managed to cover. And yes, Charlie, I have to say, I think um, what that demonstrates perhaps the Cambridge case is uh, the minister um, not being too troubled by some of these issues. I have to say, unless it's a European dimension, I'm not sure the water company can always insist on a Grampian condition. Uh, requiring connection. They're statutorily obliged to provide connection. Um, so people who worry about that and the waste waste water treatment works, not sure that's legitimate either. Anyway, I'm going to talk about Nuneaton. Um, and uh, this is an appeal by Gladman against Nuneaton, um, Bedford uh, uh, and Bedford Council, Bedworth Council, sorry. And it was for 500 homes and um, all the additional bits and pieces. And the appeal was dismissed. Now, this completes a set of um, fairly disappointing appeals from the development industry's point of view. Uh, there have been a number of major appeals in this area, close to the A5 in Warwickshire, which have been dismissed. Um, Gladman had another appeal dismissed fairly recently. Richborough Estates had an appeal dismissed. Um, and um, uh, basically, the problem is traffic, which is exactly what I was talking about two weeks ago. Um, National Highways were a Rule 6 party to this case, um, and there were two case management conferences, and uh, following the first of these, it was identified there'd be late submission of um, road traffic modelling, a BISIM model, which we all know is micro-simulation models, 
Um, but it was ruled that that was too late. The inspector ruled it was too late and he wouldn't allow Gladman to introduce that evidence. They went ahead all the same um, and they overcame lots of issues surrounding um, the location, uh, character and appearance of the area. Basically, the inspector said it was a good site, uh, save for the fact that there was a a traffic problem. It's a big 64-hectare site on the edge of Nuneaton on the north side. The issue was, as it was two weeks ago, uh, highways. Um, And if we just turn to paragraph 49, there's a local plan policy uh, which... um, uh, required the proposal uh, would need to meet acceptable levels uh, um, uh, traffic impact on the highway network and then obviously paragraph 115 um, which is in the MPPF and that creates the inspector said a high bar for refusal of permission on highway grounds no suggestion from any party that there was any inconsistency between the policy and HS2 I mean it might be said HS2 the local plan policy set a different test but nobody was arguing there was inconsistency basically i suspect everybody realized they had to pass um or, or the council had to demonstrate a national highway had to demonstrate a breach of paragraph 115 of the mppf um and obviously that's the severe test it's important to highlight the inspector said that neither the council nor national highways claimed the impacts would be severe so how did it get dismissed on that basis? Well, um, this is the subtlety. If we turn to paragraph 50, what was said was instead the council asserted that the appellant had not demonstrated that the proposal would not have severe impacts and that, um, uh, in other words, the, the appellant had to demonstrate through evidence, particularly through traffic modelling, uh, that there would not be a severe impact. Now, you might think that's a subtle difference, and it is a subtle difference, but of course, it all depends on the data. Um, And the position basically was there was not reliable data to ascertain whether the effects would um, be severe or not. Um, The council's case, uh, there's quite a lot of detail here. The council's case um, was to refer the authority uh, to refer Gladman to the Warwickshire County Council Local Transport Plan. From that, they then needed to produce, um, uh, with reference to a position statement, the appropriate modelling. The modelling wasn't produced. Um, there was an interim transport assessment, but it didn't contain um, the necessary visit modelling um, to look at the relevant junctions. So it was dismissed on that on that basis. Um, the appellant argued a rounded judgment should be taken on the available data, but the inspector was clear they, they needed to produce the VISIM model. Um, what's interesting is uh, what happened at the inquiry. If we go to paragraph 62, we can see um, that uh, it was actually through cross-examination that the uh, uh, by the uh, barrister for the council, uh, Richard Humphreys, that the appellant's highway witness conceded that the impact on queuing along Eastborough Way was, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, potentially severe. And that concession, the inspector concluded, cast significant doubt over the strength of the appellant's overall case. There's some comments about re-examination. But basically, uh, that concession was made through cross-examination. These inquiries are important for these reasons. Um, So we just have a look at the appearances. We can see that uh, it was led by Richard Humphreys for the council, and mostly a local authority team. So lots of local authority officers, Mike will be pleased with this, uh, successfully defending the position for the council. Of course, Warwickshire County Council as the highway authority were there as well. And um, uh, and out, a couple of outside consultants, I think probably Radmore was in terms of landscape. Um, so well done to the council. Commiserations to um uh, gladman and it's interesting you wonder if you're looking at this issue you might be interested to know that there was another appeal weddington road in nuneaton two miles away where the inspector very recently reached a different conclusion said there wasn't a severe impact um, but turned it down on other grounds landscape grounds so important to look at both of those decisions i think the crucial point in the case is the way the council put their case which is that we're not saying a severe impact we're just saying the evidence doesn't demonstrate that um, uh, a severe impact uh, has been overcome. So um, 
there you go. That's the case. Thanks, Chris. Fascinating, as you say, a vindication of, of cross-examination there. Now, I was just about to attempt um, to summarise a case I've only just read in the style of Paul Tucker and make <laughs> it actually good of myself. But the man's arrived on cue, once again returning to your favourite theme of being in uh, vehicles in random car parks. So, Paul, you're going to tell us about a solar farm. The sun always shines in Bedfordshire. Uh, he does, and indeed I can, can say it definitely also shines uh, down in Sussex, which is where I am, and I've literally walked out two minutes ago from cross-examining on flood risk, of all things, which is all very exciting. Um, so, uh, firstly, apologies for, for being late, um, but I'm going to talk about a, a solar farm at Brogborough Landfill Site, um, which you should be adding to uh, your list of tourist uh, visits. That's a site in central Bedfordshire. It's a scheme on a 68-hectare site, on a largely restored landfill, or there were some issues uh, about it, located between Milton Keynes and Bedford. Decision of Mr. Inspector Ware. Application uh, submitted 1st of, uh, sorry, 27th of January uh, in 2022. And the appeal was allowed, as we can see very recently, 24th September. It produces four, 40 megawatts uh, solar farm and will be there for 35 years. The inspector said he rejected that as being a temporary period because rightly he said what's always said in these events that that's somebody's lifetime and it's a generation therefore you can't really call it gen uh, a generational one it's a mineral site uh, from the 80s it was landfilled over many years finished in 2008 um lots and lots of landscaping but it was described as being a, a man-made landscape with lots of gassing methane wells surface piping and definitely not agriculture um, the land, the actual solar farm would only cover about eight percent of the overall site, and that the construction of the solar panels was shallow, pi- shallow piled, uh, and concrete um, shoes, as they're describing, so as not to impact upon the landfill's uh, cap. I've got to say, it's a really shrewd way of getting round to the sort of valued landscape issue and finding a a, a, a use which is useful in the current uh, climate in terms of renewables for an artificial landscape. Um, so I suspect this may lead to other landfill uh, sites or former landfill sites being brought forward uh, for this sort of use. But the inspector noted no allocation for renewables in the local plan, uh, no need to demonstrate need in national guidance. There was an existing grid connection because these methane wells were being used for energy from waste uh, connection, no loss of agricultural land, no highways or other technical issues. It was really all about biodiversity and, and landscape and visual. The Skylarks uh, would be uh, individually affected, apparently, which sounds horrifying for the individual Skylarks, but overall, a net benefit in ecology. And for the uh, landscape, not a valued landscape, and in fact, ultimately would give rise to some effect, but actually very limited uh, in the, the judgments of the inspector. To be blunt, this is uh, a call to arms to check out those restored landfills and think about whether there's any south-facing elements of them. But an interesting case, and it's one of those cases where you go onto the website to have a look at the planning portal, and you get that sent down many, many rabbit holes about the uh, about the, the past use of the site. So I enjoyed reading into this one. Thank you, Charlie. And again, apologies, Mike, for not saying hello when I first came on. It's like the old days, Paul, Paul using the term rabbit holes and being in a car. Did you not lying about? <laughs> <laughs> not yet, anyway. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it, that... Three, at least three of us have been uh, involved in inquiries this week relating to flood, flood risk. That's very revealing. I know Chris and, and I have too, as well, in all different parts of the country. Um, we ought to have a flood risk-themed um, uh, episode at one stage. Um, now, over to Sasha, and you're going to um, more fully introduce our guest, Mike, and um, start the interview. So let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Charlie. I absolutely am, and it's great, delightful to have a man of Kent on the show. And I also say this with a Kentish mother. We have a bit of a northern bias because of Tucker, so it's nice to uh, rebalance it in an appropriate way. So, Mike, welcome. You are the chair of the Planning um, Officers Society, which is obviously a very important organisation in the British planning system. 2,000 members. You estimate 80% of local authorities have members. It seeks to represent planners and it obviously um, styles itself, which is quite interesting, as the credible voice of public sector planners in England. And the aim of the society is to make a major contribution to achieving sustainable development in ways that are fair and equitable and achieve the social, economic and environmental aspirations of the community. 
So that's your your current position. Personally, you're obviously a planner. You've got a remarkable experience of over 40 years. Most of it, if not all, was in local government until 2015. And you've had experience of being the head of service for 14 years within London. Since 2015, you had a consultancy, and I think it's fair to say principal clients are assisting LPAs in performing and auditing their planning departments and telling them how to be more effective. So welcome. It's quite We've had many, many guests, I think 104 guests on the show. I think you'll probably have as much experience in the local planning authority sphere as anyone we've had. So welcome. It's great to have you. And obviously over the next half hour, we're going to seek to dig into your experience and knowledge to find some solutions. Now, before we do that in terms of local government, just let me give you an opportunity just to explain to many of our viewers who are planners and local authority planners what what how do you perceive the planning officers society and its role within planning in the uk well i suppose the easiest way of putting it is that we're a support network for planners <clears throat> who've got that dot gov dot uk at the end of their email address so um whilst most of our membership is from local planning authorities um homes england are a member and you know in theory um, MHCLG could be a member, so we we support planners, you know, throughout the the, the public sector uh, uh, effectively, um, and that support network is quite important. Um, most of our sort of active members are chief planners, heads of DM, heads of policy, and and you know when you're in that position, you haven't got peers to to bounce ideas at, uh, across. So you know, meeting regularly, um, chewing the fat, uh, and then washing it down with a beer afterwards. Is is a a great way of, of of keeping up to speed and 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 you know, work, working your way through the latest issues. I suppose we could call ourselves a think tank, but but we certainly produce um, pieces for for mainly for government to to, to lobby them uh, in order to pursue what we consider excellence in planning practice. You know, we we're, we're very keen uh, to 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 be a critical friend of government and work proactively in improving the system. And then I suppose finally we we have a sort of commercial arm, we'll call it, um, which is is very successful and provides uh, an awful lot of training uh, for our members, and quite a lot of that it, we're able to provide uh, free. So you know we promote best practice. And has your membership benefited you professionally in the sense of has it helped with your knowledge uh, of the planning system, the kind of interaction you've had at being a member of the planning officers society? Very much so. I mean, I, I, it's a little bit complicated in London in that there's there's a thing called the Association of London Borough Planning Officers. I won't explain it all, but it's all now part of POS. Uh, but I started off as in, a, a, you know, most of my career has been in, in DC, DM. And so I, I, I went along to that, became chair of that. And it was Steve Cordermain who asked me to set up POS London. Uh, there wasn't a, a, a POS uh, in, in London because of the LBPOs. Um, so yeah, I I I started off Pos London, and and we're now you know very active. We have a both a chief planners network, we have a DM policy enforcement and technical support network. So it is important for people, and it you know it helps you. You know, you, you you come across something new. Someone out there has done it before, so you know there's a phone call, an email, and um, you don't you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Someone's there to help you. It, it, it's a great support network. And not only that, the outward facing. How, how how would you describe your relationship with government, and particularly the Department of Relevance? Well, we we have a, a good relationship. It, it, it's varied over the years, but that I think down to the personalities involved. Um, but I think I think one of the things that I've um, noticed is that it, things have changed. There, there used to be a planning sounding board, which was a cross sector uh, meeting that, that that was regularly held. And and that that stopped. I don't know. I, I would say about four years ago, maybe five years ago, and, and I think things have suffered since. You know that 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 used to be a very useful sounding board to sort of dry run policy or you know uh, new legislation be, before it sort of hit the street and sort of sense check it. Um, we're, we're not seeing uh, that that sort of engagement as much as we used to. So I'm I'm hoping. 
perhaps with a new government, um, uh, that, you know, that that's going to change because I think it is important that we, we, you know, we do have that sort of cross sector input uh, in into it because certainly what I've found is that actually most of the private sector are, are on pretty much the same page as the public sector uh, on probably 80, 85% of the issues. And, and, you know, we're all in the business of yeah, doing good development. And, and, and I think it's important that, that, that government sort of sees us as a, as a single voice on, on a lot of issues to, 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 to understand what, what, what the best way forward is. And what about your relationship with the RTPI? Do you have formal or informal links with the RTPI? Uh, yeah, we, we, we're not only linked to them, but um, we, we have good relationships uh, with the RTPI. Uh, there's a, an initiative at the moment that, that they're very much part of is that uh, we've, we've got a sort of cross-sector um, uh, initiative. It was called the Planning Summit, but we're now calling it the Planning Alliance. Uh, that clashed with Planning Magazine's conference. Um, but but it, it's really trying to optimise what we do to solve the problem of resources in, in the public sector. And, and, and the HBF are there, the um, uh, BPF are there, etc. Uh, and and it's very much POS and, and RTPI sort of leading on that. Not 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 to reinvent the wheel, but but by having that hive mind as as it's been called, you know what they're doing and what we're doing can be improved. We can identify the gaps and and make sure we're doing all we can to to to, to sort those problems out. Okay, and can you did you say obviously you've said about your you've mentioned about your relationship with government and Sandy Board etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's fair to say on your website, and I recommend it to everyone to have a look, you've obviously done quite a substantial and significant representation on the consultation MPPF. Yeah. Just for the benefit of our viewers, can you just summarise the points that you perceive as chair are probably the most important elements of the representation to government? Yeah, I will. Um, I mean, we, we, we welcomed the, 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 the changes broadly, um, yeah, repairing a, a, a lot of the perhaps misplaced uh, amendments that, that have been put in place in the past. But but I think I, I would highlight sort of four areas where, where, where I think it, it, it falls short. Um, government has recognised the issue of resources. Um, you know, it, it's a crisis. It's a generational thing, and it will take probably generations to fix, um, you know, get, getting kids into, into planning, uh, get, getting them from their courses into the public sector, getting them experienced is going to take a long time. So uh, great initiatives, but we need to stick with it. There's also a retention issue that, that, that we need to um, we need to address. Um, you know, it's all too easy uh, for planners and often experienced planners to go off to the private sector. And, and we need to uh, we need to look at that. But the main message from us was, can we stick to the knitting? And Charlie gave a a prime example of of us getting embroiled in 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 areas that that are covered by other legislation. Mm. Now, what we're saying to government is, you need to do a piece of work that looks at all of this and set it out very very clearly and very very explicitly in the MPPF, uh, because you know the, the the couple of words that says you know you should stick to the knitting in the MPPF are not enough, uh, and 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 we do we do need to sort that out, and and that will create resources. Insta- you know, not instantaneously, but very, very, very quickly. The housing delivery test, we're saying we don't deliver housing. So why are we why are we measured on it? It should be scrapped. It's not fair. Um, we, yeah, we don't build the houses. Measure us on local plan provision. Measure us on the quality of decision making, uh, by all means. I think our concern is if we continue with the housing delivery test and five-year housing land supply, and then we apply the new standard method to that uh, the system's going to collapse it will collapse and and you know is that what you want so our, our message to government is to think these things through um and 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 introduce these things sensibly um ra- rather than as as as, as, as um, may be proposed then on that stand um we actually think it's a mistake our, our view is we we need to plan to deliver housing to meet our housing need absolutely the standard method does not measure housing need, nor does it give any thought to the capacity of places to deliver that number. Um, it, you know, 
I can give examples, but you're all aware of them, of, of silly increases, ridiculous increases uh, that can't possibly be met. And similarly, decreases in areas that, that actually have the ability to, to, to deliver more. So we, we have set out, and it's in one of our manifestos, which are um, on, on our website, a standard of effort that deals with the criticisms that the that, that, that government um, put in the, uh, in, in the consultation. The main one being um, perpetuating under, under delivery from the past. And what we're saying is the standard method should look at the demography, births over deaths, etc., migration, mainly within the country rather than with, from abroad, but also what we're calling hidden households. So those people who are still living with mum and dad in their 20s, 30s and even 40s, homelessness, etc., etc. And 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 then we, we, we can produce a figure that's realistic. And the final one is is the Green Belt. We really welcome the, the, the sensible conversation on the Green Belt. We've been calling for that for a decade. Um, again, there's a manifesto called We Need to Talk About the Green Belt that sets out our position. Fundamentally, the Green Belt is, is an urban containment zone. It is not an environmental policy. And our worry is that the Grey Belt perpetuates that myth that it's an environmental policy. And, you know, we, we think the solution is a lot more simpler than government is, is putting in place. You need, to, you, know, you need to have a decent standard method. You need to deliver on that with a brownfield first strategy. Other strategies such as new towns. Then if there is a residual housing need, what we're saying is you must review your green belt in order to find the sites. Full stop. But can I just take you up on one of those points because deliverability, I mean, whatever, however, whatever journey one takes to the end destination, i.e. the target, the requirement, history shows that we have been poor, whatever perspective you take, we've been poor at hitting that target. I mean, what is your view? about the failures, the historic failures and deliverability. I mean, where, where, I mean, you've obviously got, as I've said, enormous experience in this. Where do you lay the blame of the failure to deliver historically through the planning system? Um, I could talk about this for hours, but I'll keep it very brief. It's quite clear from the data that the house builders will not deliver that number. That's not a criticism of them. That's their business model. You know, they, they, since the 70s, they have been delivering, oscillating between 100 and 150,000 homes a year. They, they slightly increased that just before the, the, the big bust in, in 1989 and again before the global financial crisis, they went up slightly. So the solution can't be found with the house builders. We've got a, a, a system that's dominated by quite a few big players. And we, we need to pick up Oliver Letwin's advice that we need to find ways to, to nurture, increase and grow the SME sector. And there's, there's lots of things we can do around that. The other area that concerns me, if, if you um, do a search of the MPPF for rent, you find zero returns. We haven't got any policies around that. If you look at um, major cities throughout the world, they will have a large scale institutionally backed quality rental sector we haven't got that it's just starting to grow we've probably you know been um uh, growing over the last sort of 10 years but but we need we need to invest in that and and there's a ton of money wanting to invest in that yeah we used to invest our pensions in retail um that's probably not a good investment anymore so you know i'm told that there's you know billions out there to invest in it patient money and then finally you know if you look at that classic chart of how you know new housing delivery since the war you know, up until the 70s, the, that extra 150000 a year, give or take, was provided by the public sector. And we need to, they need to do that again. They say, ah, oh, we can't afford it. Actually, you can. We spend £9 billion a year on the housing benefit. We're probably spending, getting close to, if not beyond, £2 billion a year on temporary accommodation. I work it, worked it out it, on the basis of 150 k per unit. That's 120,000 homes a year. That, that, that you can build for that money so it's not that we can't afford it it's about you know, it's about investing in 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 our future in our people well i i yeah that's a very interesting point and just slightly to ask you about that i mean that absolutely sounds right but from your experience now you've had nine years out of local government 
I mean, do you see, if, let's imagine local authorities were making applications to get us to 125 a year. W- would members have the courage and political desire to grant their their house building arms, the kind of permissions that were granted in the 50s and 60s? Or do you think the mentality and attitude of members has changed fundamentally to listen to greatly to those that oppose house building? I, I, I think it, it it varies clearly. Um, I mean, there's been research done by UCL uh, that, that that shows there's a significant amount of council house building activities in various forms. You know, there, there's various ways of doing it, various models, um, and and you know, we 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 do need to 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 gear up to do that again. I mean, I, I look at the um, you know that chart um, and it starts recording after the Second World War. Within two years, we were delivering 150,000 homes. Now, they were probably, um, border ca- uh, not border cabins, what were they? The um, Pre- the prefabs. Pre- Pre- um, but, you know, have we got a crisis or haven't we? You know, let's, let's you know, let's get, put our big boy and girl pants on and, and, and get on with it. Um, you know, it, it's going to be hard work. But, but um, you know, what we're proposing is more of the same and... We know what Einstein said about that. I, I actually did an inquiry in Leeds four years ago where the residents were desperate to keep those houses. <laughs> they had a bit of attachment. I think a list, didn't <laughs> um, Now tell me, let, let's now t- take off your Planning Officers Society app for a moment and let's delve into your experience for many years. What, what, how did you find? I mean, looking back on your career, did did working for a local authority and working in planning did it provide satisfaction? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I mean, I I sort of celebrated actually fifty years um, about a month ago. So so I had forty years in in local government, uh, ten years in in the public sector, and and I I started work um, at sixteen. Um, so I I. I wasn't a great lover of school, but but actually I did much better at my O levels than everyone thought I was going to do. Um, but but I got a job at the GLC. My dad played golf with the, um, the sort of chief architect planner at the GLC, and he sent through um, three sort of internal job adverts: one for a, a civil engineering technician, one for a building technician, and one for a planning technician. And I was interviewed for all three and got the planning one. So it wasn't something I chose. But it's a career that I've absolutely loved. So it was a fantastic place to start my career. I was there for 10 years be- before it was abolished. Um, and and surround- it was a centre of excellence. And, and, and I'm, I'm forever grateful um, for that. And yes, yeah, so I've, I've worked um, in quite a few London boroughs. There's a sort of joke in Pos London that I've worked for them all. But I'm, I'm in three quarters of the way. <laughs> um, Can I just ask you, with, it, with experience... <laughs> You uh, we know that that Margaret Thatcher made it a major political aim to destroy the GLC because yeah. of see our relationship with Ken Livingstone and others. He was driving her up with the uh, uh, with various slogans. Uh, just uh, outside of my office window, funny. Enough. Yeah, <laughs> we were on that. Oh. <laughs> but would you, if you would have had the power back in 1985, would you have kept the GLC? Do you think it was a force for good or not? It's a good question. I mean, it, it operated very differently to, to the GLA, and I, I, I think it probably did need to be um, reformed. But having said that, it it was probably more strategic than than the GLA is. Um, the, the GLA sort of drilled that into a lot of detail. I, I remember the Greater London Development Plan was probably about just over half an inch thick, and you all know how big the London Plan is. So, so I think I think there's good parts of the GLC, good parts of the GLA, and the ideal strategic authority will be a, a blend of the two. I think. And tell me about um, what would you? Let's hear your manifesto. Obviously, I mean we've talked about the res, the resources issue, and it's a it's a it's probably the most recurring theme we've had on the show in our four and a half years of life, the resources issue is a huge, huge problem for the operation of planning in this country. I mean, what would you do if you were made the Minister for Planning? What would you do to help assist local authorities? Apart from the obvious of just chucking more money, but what other routes would you take? 
I, I, yeah, I mean, it's, there's an, an awful lot to be done, but I, I would pick on sort of four. Um, one is um, permitted development rights can can be really useful, but 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 the the stuff that's being put in place are being frankly shameful in terms of the conversions of offices, etc. But one thing you could do that that would free up uh, an awful lot of time. Most authorities have residential extension guidelines and probably guidelines for other things, shop fronts or whatever. And to convert those into a form of PD. So the, the process would be that you would submit your plans in order for the council to check that they meet the residential extension guidelines. No consultation. And it, it could be probably a desk based exercise. So, so that would you know, enable an awful lot of applications that are pretty much always going to get approved um, to, 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 to just be ticked off. No need to consult because, you know, if you object, it's still going to get approved because it meets the guidelines and, and there's no good reason to do otherwise. Um, fast tracking the simple stuff and, and you know, um, a lot of authorities do that, but but, but would push that uh, more. But so do the big stuff properly. And for me, that means involving members in the pre-application stage, not or not any members, the, me- the members of the planning committee at the pre-application stage and making sure that they express their opinion. They express their opinion on the aspects of the development, not the development as a whole. And now I've, I put that in place um, you know, many, many years ago in, in previous authorities, and I had no end of resistance from the legal teams saying, oh, they can't, you know, predetermine. I said, no, they're not predetermined. I mean, they're predisposed to good design, delivering your housing policies, to making sure the highway network is safe, et cetera, et cetera. Just because they like or don't like the design or, or you know, whatever, that doesn't mean it's going to get refused or approved. Uh, you know, they, they have to do the planning balance and, and therefore they are not predetermined. And then we had the 2011 Act to... to to put in legislation what was sort of common law anyway, but 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 I, I don't think enough councils have picked up on that. And and there's still that reluctance to get members involved in the pre application stage in order to um deliver their 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 duty, if you like, on, under the MPPF to be proactive and approve things that can be approved. And then finally, um and this is my sort of thing, not pause we should consider whether the cabinet should make those big decisions. Now, the executive in London, the mayor, is the planning authority, makes those planning decisions. So why isn't the executive in a local council taking those big, important strategic decisions? I'll just leave that hanging. Okay, I've got just a couple more questions I want to ask you. Uh, If... If you were speaking to your 21-year-old self, Mm. would you say go into planning and go into local authority planning or would you seek to dissuade them with the benefit of hindsight? Well, it would have been my 16-year-old self. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely right. And and I I would say go for it because you've you've had great fun and and you've had a great career and um, you've met some wonderful people and dealt with some amazing development. So off you go, boy. Have fun. Now, also, let me ask you this, and I I require a level of honesty. There is a perception, which I probably share, that the calibre of members at local authority level has declined. And it's it's just a perception. It's not based on any empirical evidence. And I just wanted your view. You obviously have worked very closely with many, many members at the JLC and your local authorities. Do you endorse that view or do you disagree? Do you contradict it? I, I I think there is some truth in that. And and I think I know a significant reason for it. And and it is the one thing I thank Margaret Thatcher for. She introduced politically restricted posts. And um, prior to that, um, or, or if that wasn't introduced, the chances are I would have been persuaded to become a local councillor and I'll be a chair of some planning committee. Mm. Um, uh, and 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 thank God I I, I am un, unable to do that. And I certainly found I've worked in various authorities with with different sort of um, uh, controls, 
and and I I, I noticed it partic- particularly with the Labour Party because they would have drawn a, a, a disproportionate amount of their membership from the public sector. That 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 after that was introduced in the whenever it was um, the seventies, um, that that the the, the calibre went downhill, and I I experienced that sort of firsthand. Um, and and I think they probably struggled um, ever since to 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 um, uh, to to repair that. But um, no, I think the, um, the 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 other problem is is the you know the, with social media etc. It's so easy to do that sort of knee jerk reaction and that response. Whereas when you had to write a letter or then a fax, um, you know you 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 were a little bit more considered and and perhaps a little bit more measured. So. Um, certainly, that um, that that side of things is 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 more challenging. Brilliant, thank you. Right. Well, let let me ask my dear colleagues to ask a question. Mary, do you have a question for Mike? I do, I do, Mike. I just want to take you back to the Planning Officers Society's response to the uh, MPPF, the draft MPPF, and in that, um, in the context of uh, Greenbelt, you you refer to strategic policy. Um, at, at strategic level policy yeah. and strategic level reviews, and you suggested that there must be, as you've explained, uh, greenbelt reviews if uh, authorities can't meet their own housing numbers. Yeah. But at what strategic level do you think that these greenbelt reviews ought to be conducted? Is is really my question? Yeah. So when when you're producing your housing numbers whatever standard method that you're using, those methods fall apart at the geography of a local council. They, they, they really only have statistical validity at that larger strategic geography, whatever that might be. And, and so what we're saying is that, that you would have your housing numbers calculated at that larger geography, effectively with policy off. So that's your, you know, um, strategic housing market assessment, your, your yeah. schlar. You then do your schlar um, in order to distribute that with policy on. And as part of that, if, if, if you know, obviously it's brownfield first and, and you, 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 you test um, the, the capacity of, of places and, and that's where the uh, boroughs and the strategic body need to work together, like they do in London, um, you know, the, 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 the capacity exercise in London. And then at the end of that process, uh, if there is a residual, as I said, you, you need to review your green belt. And then that's a process of, I think you take the green belt layer off. You then look for sustainable development opportunities. Uh, you, you certainly go brownfield first, but if you need to, uh, you, you develop on green fields. Uh, it's an exercise of finding the least harm, if you like, of, yep. of all the options in order to house your population. And, yeah, and, yeah. and maybe that's the important thing. that, that uh, when, when I do member training, I, I, I say there's three Ps in planning, people, place, and prosperity, and the most important is people. And if we're not housing our population, then then shame on us. So mm. that, that, that's the, you know, the, the, the Thank process you. that would need to happen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Charlie. Hi, thanks, thanks, Sasha. Hi, Mike. Um, I'll come back to the issue of AI, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, we hear a lot, quite rightly, about um, resources, and the resources issue in planning, particularly at local authority level, and particularly the pressures on uh, planning officers and the fact there's not enough of them. And I've just been wondering, do you think AI might, in, in time, perhaps not yet, but in time, help? We won't really complete panacea, but help with that by perhaps um, freeing up time. For example, you, you could conceive of, AI dealing with PD because it's fairly, or, or yeah. you could imagine that being done, etc. Is that um, a, a sort of something on the horizon? Do you think? I think well, absolutely. Um, but but I think we 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 need to prepare for it. And and I think if you're um, applying what is AI digital or is it beyond digital? But you know you're you're applying a sort of digital model to an analog system. We mm. we probably need to start looking at the system. To, 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 to alter it so that it is able to um, optimise its use of things uh, like AI. Um, the, the, 
the, the one area that concerns me, and, and it's, it's, it's the biggest failure of my career, is that um, I like a short report um, or a short appeal statement. And, and in order to do that, you need to write it afresh. And the, the, the trouble is that um, since the advent of the computer, um, you know, when I started, I had to write it out, send it down to the typing pool. Um, but um, you know, the advent of the computer and cut and paste, these reports have become bloated and bloated. You're well, well aware of it. And consultants are, 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 are just as bad. And I, I think that is um, important because those officers are editors, not authors. And that's a different thought process. And I've come across, um, you know, where officers have not really thought it through because they're not thinking about it afresh. They're in this sort of world of I've got to get this report together and I've added this, this, this. And, you know, how can I make sure that I haven't put the wrong address in and all that sort of stuff. And and my worry is, is, is AI just a different version of that? It, you know, if it takes the, uh, the, the, you know, the case file and, and, and summarizes it, you know, I, you know, yes, it frees up time for officers to to think afresh. But are they, if 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 that's what they're engaging in? So I'm 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 sort of positive about it, but but got got a couple of worries in the back of my back of my head. Only interesting. Thanks very much indeed, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. CW. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sasha. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, hi. Well done for all the work you do. You're completely dedicated to this job. And uh, and the and the officers, you are a think tank. Don't don't underestimate yourself. A very valuable think tank. Um, can I thank Catherine Munro and my team for suggesting I open the curtains and let a bit of light in? It's not quite so dark now. <laughs> Looks a bit odd before, if we're honest. Um, yeah, I mean, my question is, and you've commented on this before. I know. What would you like government to take off the shoulders of? planning officers because you know money is not the complete answer everything now is a planning condition uh catherine was telling me about 100 planning conditions on james marici's wisley um airfield you know 100 conditions um what would you ask government to take off the shoulders of planning officers so so yes i mean we had a classic example with the um what was it the darwin green uh, water abstraction you know there there, there was a an issue there and, and as i understand it that's also covered through the building regulations you know you can't get building reg sign off unless your house is supplied with water and sewage and drainage etc so you know there, there's plenty of controls out there to do that but we get embroiled in it and and there's a myriad of examples of that of, of conditions you know wheel washing equipment you know to stop muck going on the highways uh, it's an offence under the Highways Act to deposit mud on the highway, so it just needs to be an informative. Um, envi- various environmental health uh, stuff. I mean, we've even got it in 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 the PPG. Uh, sorry, uh, in in the um, um, PDR that, that that you have to have um, construction management plans and things like that. They're they're all things covered by other legislation and and can be dealt with um, through informatives. Um, but but I think you know we we've loaded things on and. You know, two, two examples, recent examples that spring to mind, biodiversity net gain. Yeah, you know, an arbitrary 10%. I've, you know, I've come across a site which had, a, I think, it 270% increase. All it was, it was a concrete car park with a a, a replacement multi-storey car park and it had a green wall. You know, biodiversity net gain is a design challenge. And and if, if 5% is, is right, then that's right. But, you know, on that site, we should have had, or 500 percent you know we should have had a lot more landscaping than, than was proposed the other one is fire safety um when you know after, after grenfell the, the london plan was being put in place and we had policy d12 and if you read d12 it's almost requiring you to to, to go into significant detail in terms of um you know the the, the the elements that are being put in place the gateway one that government introduced is effectively saying you need to think about your fire strategy so that you design your building in a way that it can accommodate that fire strategy so you don't have to come back because you need another staircase or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and, and, and therefore, all we really need is a tick on the planning application form have you considered your fire strategy and is this building designed to deliver it? Yes. 
And if they haven't, then they have to come back. And yeah. The planning Commission, and it's their fault. We're not delivering fire safety, and nor should we. And one of the criticisms, and I can't remember her name now, who did the, the first review, was it wasn't clear who was responsible. Building regulations is responsible, not planning. So, so there's lots of examples where it's so easy, I'll oh, get the planners to do it. Or we're our own worst enemies. Oh, we'll put a condition on because we're trying to save the world, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and we need to stick to the knitting because we haven't got the resources to do all those other things. Very, very helpful. Thank you, Mike. Excited. Thank you, Chris. Paul, you uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. First of all, um, I hope you noticed, Mike, it, that the, the bot we had asking the question about AI in the face of Charlie Banner is actually AI. We replaced Charlie about a year ago. <laughs> I thought I thought we'd improve. Yeah, yeah. It's just sort of back <laughs> we're, we're, we're working on it. Um, I've got a really simple question, which is: Why don't we do the obvious things like model conditions, like model uh, policies, like ditching testing plans for viability, like charging for appeals? Why don't we do the simple things? Why are we always blue sky thinking? I, I know there's there's an awful lot of basic stuff that that, that can be done. I mean the the, the standard conditions that there are a set of standard conditions still around, as you all know. The appendix to Circular Eleven Ninety Five wasn't scrapped when the PPG came in, but hey, it's um, how many years old? Twenty plus thirty years old, yeah. and 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 boy, does it it's worth a read just for a laugh. Um, but <laughs> we're quite simply. Uh, get the pink model <laughs> conditions as the update to Appendix A. Stick that in the PPG, and it's job done. Yeah, you, know, you could you could do it over the weekend. Thank you, Mike. Charlie, back to you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Sasha. Well, that's all we've got time for today, Mike. Thank you. A um, number of people have said in the comments. Wonderful to hear someone talk such common sense. It's very that, that's a that that real theme for today, along with David Barry. Um, so uh, thank you so much indeed for coming. So uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time on the seventeenth of October, um, and so we very much look forward to um, seeing you all then. Take care and thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Mike. <laughs>